Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Borja Guneri, English lecturer at Atatürk University, and I'll be leading Professor James Curran's keynote speaker session today. In fact, on behalf of you and myself, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Professor Curran because he had a major operation six, to, six days ago and is still recovering but he is here today to honor us by gathering all his strength. Um, and as all you know, Professor James Kern is the Professor of Communications at Goldsmith University of London, the author of numerous books, including Power Without Responsibility, which won the International Communications Association Fellows Classic Book Award in 2019, Today, he is going to talk about the title, Are We Living Through a Media Revolution? Now, uh, please welcome Professor Karen. Well, thank you very much. It's a privilege to be speaking at your university and your conference. Um, and as it was mentioned, I'm recovering from surgery. And it seems to have affected my voice for some reason. Um, so this keynote may not be perfect, um, but I thought I should honor my commitment. People who pull out are a pain. Um, and I thought I'd try not to be a pain. Um, so are we living through a media revolution? Um, even to ask the question is seemingly to supply the answer after all bookshops and newspapers are closing. The rise of social media provides a new means of self-expression and of social connection. The rise of search engines provides access to unprecedented quantities of information and knowledge. The growth of video games uh, has resulted in it generating more revenue than films. Um, the development of streaming services is a harbinger of a new media order. So the question seems almost redundant. It seems almost obvious that we're living through a media revolution. And these changes in the structure of the media have been underpinned by two momentous breakthroughs. The rise of the internet, originating from an American defense program, um, and the digitization of the media. The internet, as you know, is a global network of computer networks spanning now the globe. And digitization has enabled interoperation between media. It's given us the smartphone and smart TV. So you have these changes in the structure of the media underpinned by technological breakthroughs. And to reinforce the impression that we're living through a media revolution is the sheer speed of change. Um, let me give you a few figures. In 2002, 5% of the world population were internet users. In 2020, 59% of the world population for internet users. A dramatic change. Um, let me give you figures for the UK. And these figures are similar to figures in other economically developed countries, as revealed by, for example, Pew or the Reuters Institute. But the figures I'm using are coming from Ofcom. In 2011, 27% of the UK population had a smartphone. By 2019, that was 79%. So in the space of eight years, a minority item has become universal. Smart TV. In 2012, just 5% had smart TV. By 2019, 50% had smart TV. The average time spent per week online in 2018 is 24 hours, 24 hours. 
that's almost twice as much as in 2011. And as I mentioned, similar figures are true of America, Germany, South Korea, and other countries. And further changes are in the wings. C can you hear me all right? We can. We can. We can. can. We can. Great. No problem. Good. <laughs> Good. Um, there's a significant generational difference. Young people spend more time online and less time watching TV than old people. So when people like me die out, you can expect an accelerated decline in TV and a continued growth of online consumption. And in addition, global streaming services have just taken off in the last three or four years. Um, and they're eclipsing now national broadcasters because they have more money. And in the next 30 years, um, they will be the dominant force in the way that Hollywood film became the dominant force in the interwar period. So everything's changing. Of course, there's a media revolution. Or maybe it's not so clear cut. Um, there are continuities. TV, including access through online sources, is still the most popular news platform in the UK in 2020. If you ask the question, um, do you get your news? Where do you get the news from? The majority said the internet. But as Ofcom has found out, a large number are getting access to TV through their mobile phone. Um, TV is still important. It still accounts for the most important segment of audience time. Surprisingly, radio is the great survivor in countries like Britain, Ireland, Germany. In the UK, 89% listened to the radio during the week in 2018, averaging 20.9 hours. And what we'll see is not the displacement of old media, but the development of a new hybrid system in which there is an interrelationship between old and new media. Let me give you an example. The Witcher began as a Polish um, novel series. It was then turned into a video, a video game in Poland. It was then re-edited as a video game in America. And that led to the Netflix spectacular um, um, film series, um, commanding our global audience. Lots of research shows that there's a mutual interplay between news websites, social media, press, and television. So there are continuities. But nonetheless, clearly there's been a big change in the media landscape and a big change in consumption. But if we're to address the question, are we living through a media revolution? We ought to ask further questions. Have giant media corporations been undermined? Have the media been democratized? Is the logic of power and profit subverted? Has there been a media renaissance? Have media ideological discourses been transformed? Above all, have changes in the media had a revolutionary impact on society? I think if you ask these questions, you get a more um, I hate the word nuanced, um, it's such a sort of smug word, but a more nuanced um, analysis. Let's think about um, what gurus in sharp suits predicted would happen as a consequence 
of a major revolution. Nicholas Negroponte, an esteemed professor at prestigious MIT, wrote that um, the media giants would be dethroned and the media would be a collection of cottage industries. That's not what's happened. Um, the Hollywood Big Six is now the Hollywood Five, and TV is dominated by the big free companies in a number of countries, such as Italy and Brazil. There are massive newspaper chains still in countries like Australia, Chile, and Ireland. And the most visited news websites are largely owned by legacy news organizations. The most popular 10 news websites in the UK has eight controlled by legacy media, like the Mail, like the BBC. And that's true in other countries like Sweden, America, um, and elsewhere. It was argued that the Eden to that would be the seedbed of new small business, boutique businesses. But that's not what happened. Um, Facebook in 2020 had 2.7 billion monthly active users. It's reported that Google accounted for 76% of global desktop and laptop searches in 2019. Amazon had um, 200 and billion, two, 280 billion dollars revenue in 2019. These are giant corporations. So they're bigger than the colossi of the Gilded Age, like Carnegie and Standard Oil. So, big is beautiful, contrary to what was projected as being a consequence of the media revolution. And that poses the question, why is big beautiful? In part, the answer is because large media corporations have been like the undead, feasting on the blood of young rivals. Disney was rejuvenated by the acquisition of Pixar. Um, Google bought YouTube, Microsoft bought Skype, Facebook purchased Instagram and WhatsApp. And what all these acquisitions are doing is they're providing a transplant of new blood, they're incorporating rivals who might undermine your business, um, a way of hedging bets, and a way of maintaining corporate impetus. Another reason why big is beautiful is the network effect. The more users you have, the more useful you are, as in the case of LinkedIn, the professional website, um, the, more, um, the more information that Google hoovers up, the more useful it becomes. So success breeds success. And the third reason is the enormous economic advantages of size. There are very big economies of scale in the media industries. The cost of making a film or a video game is very large, or a TV program or a newspaper. But the reproduction costs, particularly in the digital age, are very small. So the more units you can sell, the lower are your unit costs. That means you can invest more if you're a leading player and enhance the differential traction that you have over your rivals, smaller rivals. Um, Vertical and horizontal integration 
have also helped the large major enterprises. The film majors and remain major, partly because they dominate global distribution of film. Major enterprises have benefited from the linkage between film, TV and video games. So, the economic dynamics that made for the domination of large media companies has not been changed. The corporate Goliaths have not been laid low by digital Davids. What about the democratization of journalism? Guru Charlie Beck from LSE argued that two things were about to happen. One, a professional amateur partnership that would reinvent journalism and make it um, better. And secondly, new voices would emerge, new startups would emerge, leading to a renaissance of journalism. And he was one of many voices making this argument. But this did not come true. Leading news organizations did an enormously smart thing. They gave away their content free. This put startups in a double bind. If they charge a subscription fee, they deterred potential users because lots of free news content was available. But if they didn't charge a subscription fee, they would have to build up an enormous base of users sufficient to make a profit from advertising, which meant there was a big run-in period in which they would sustain large losses, um, requiring large capital. Um, so the kill in the cradle, giving away content free strategy helped to throttle startups. And most startups in the news industry have failed. There have been exceptions like HuffPost, um, but they are the exceptions. Journalists didn't like to work with amateurs. They didn't know how reliable they were, how accurate they were. They took up time. Journalists are under enormous press, deadline pressure. The swamp with information. And so they resisted working with amateurs, um, confining them to the role of sources, but not working with them as equals. And there's been very few places where um, a professional amateur partnerships worked. NBC tried it and gave up after about five years. Um, a website in South Korea, Oh My News, successfully did that but it went into decline and as a shadow of its former self. So journalism was not democratized in the way that was anticipated. What about the democratization of entertainment? Henry Jenkins, who's speaking at the conference today. Um, I was um, on a panel that helped give him an award for his famous book, Creative uh, Cultural Convergence, is that right? Um, makes a powerful argument that um, a creative participative culture is being created by social networking sites. And there's clearly some truth in this argument. Um, for example, a song called Wellerman, a 19th century Scottish um, folk ballad, um, a shanty song, I think it's called, was a terrific hit on TikTok. And the person who sang this 19th century ballad was a Scottish postman called Nathan Evans. And he got awarded a free album contract. So here's an example 
illustrating um, Henry Jenkins' thesis and the many other examples. But as against that, um, the algorithms that prioritize content, that give prominence to content, is not subject to democratic control. It's controlled by private companies. Um, these private companies have become more commercialized as they've evolved. And it turns out that Well, let me quote one study. 69% of the most viewed content on YouTube came from mainline media sources. So the content that's consumed on YouTube, the most important social networking site, um, is derived mainly from large media corporations. Um, Another study found that grassroots music on Spotify was not often accessed because people had no idea it existed. Um, I look forward to hearing a different view. Um, and um, my contention, however, is that the democratization of entertainment that was foreseen has not really fulfilled its promise. Let's look at content in a new light. A lot of the literature focuses on delivery. But has content of the media fundamentally changed? Let's think about neoliberalism. The argument that the market, when deregulated, generates prosperity. The argument that small states, low taxes, generates economic growth. The argument that um, deficits should be kept under control, opposed to the Keynesian stimulus package approach. Studies of the UK media show, not only in the press, but also in broadcasting, there was strong support for deficit, um, for austerity policies in the period after 2008. Studies of the European press, comparative press, found the same thing, that during the sovereign debt crisis, most newspapers were advocating austerity measures. A recent PhD I examined um, found that the US prestige press were opposed to major re-regulation of banks after 2008. A study I did with various colleagues in 2012, looking at the reporting in a number of countries of the anti-austerity Saritza party um, argued that if Saritza won, it would imperil the European economy and would endanger the global economy. And this was the message that came out of British media, German media, Japanese media, and American media. And they were responding to cues from international economic organizations and the mostly conservative leadership of leading um, governments, rich nation governments in that period. So neoliberalism, until the pandemic, continued to dominate um, news reporting. He's also argued that the rise of social media influences has led to the infiltration of neoliberal values. So not much evidence of a transformation of content 
has access by the majority of people in mainstream media. But the domination of neoliberalism, which has been dominant since the 1980s onwards, until the pandemic, um, has been accompanied by the rise of sexual liberalism. And you'll see a continuing pattern, irrespective of changes of technology, of growth of social liberalism, um, the rise of Hollywood feminism, a big change in post-war period. Um, the underlying assumption was that men and women had different personalities and capabilities as a consequence of their anatomy, and that this made them suited to different roles. So, how long have I talked? Um, a popular soap, I Love Lucy, a, a, a comedy, TV comedy, I Love Lucy, had an episode where the housewife agreed to go out to work for a day in her husband's office, and the husband agreed to stay at home. And um, the husband just couldn't cope at home. And the wife just couldn't cope in the office. And the episode ends with them saying, well, let's stick to what we're good at. And it was an affirmation of the man as a breadwinner and the woman as I am. That began to change, particularly from the 1980s onwards. Um, in the case of TV in Britain, there'd been a series of TV series featuring um, leading women who are leaders who are portrayed as being sympathetic and good at their job. Borgen, big international success, celebrates a female prime minister in Denmark. Um, there's been counter stereotypes. Think of Kill Bill, Hunger Games. Um, so Hollywood feminism has made further inroads. Um, which is a continuation of the past. Um, more positive representation of sexual minorities, another aspect of the rise of social liberalism. Crucially, as Larry Gross makes clear in a terrific book, um, gays and lesbians became more visible from the 1990s onwards. Um, images were more positive and there's now beginning to be in America, Britain, Brazil, and elsewhere, men kissing men, women kissing women in mainstream drama, which has the function of normalizing gay, gay, gay love. Um, a significant trend, but a trend that can be traced um, over time, that's operated independently of the so-called um, media revolution. What about misinformation? Um, it's argued that the optimization of profit by social media generates attention to extreme views and misinformation, as in the case of the anti-COVID vaccination campaign. But this is not so very different from the popular press. In Britain, uh, leading papers like the Sun and the Daily Mail had a campaign against the MMR vaccine, um, partly because it sold newspapers. So the profit motive that is so very bad in social media um, has existed in um, tabloid journalism. Um, not much difference there, though, of course, European public service broadcasting and professionally oriented US newspapers can't be accused of that kind of crassness. What about the rejuvenation of journalism that was promised? Um, well, the loss of advertising from print journalism has created news deserts with an um, increasing number of dead newspapers. Ghost newspapers essentially run from regional hubs. Um, editorial cuts leading to less good journalism. There has been 
however, a rejuvenation of TV. As a consequence of the rise of satellite and cable TV, the development of a premier subscription model, a new business model that's allowed greater creative autonomy for TV drama and the rise of new streaming services like Netflix. So we are living through a TV renaissance. So we get a mixed outcome in this case. Let's very briefly, and I seem to have talked for longer than I attended, um, let's briefly consider the impact of the so-called media revolution. Has it been revolutionary? Um, one of the dreams, the hippie dreams, was that the internet would provide social connection, greater empathy, greater understanding. Um, and this is partly true. And it's illustrated by a wonderful Google commercial, which would be great if we could have a look at. Do you want to, it to be shared now? Why not? Is an ice cream break? Okay. Um, I'm just saying it to Mr. Akblut. Could you please uh, show the video? The video is a graphic illustration of the social connection theme and understanding theme of um, the internet. Here is the video. Ye Yusuf, Langoria yaar si mera. Needs to be subtitled. Ye Yusuf, Langoria yaar si mera. Lahor me maare kar ke samne ek bada baat tha. उस बाग का गेट बाबा आजम के जमाने में रोज शाम को हमने वहाँ पतंगे उड़ानी और उसके बाद जाके यीशु के दुकान से जजरिया चुरा के खानी जजरिया और मेरा साहब नमस्ते नमस्ते मेरी पुती मुंबई वाली और बेटे क्या हाल चाल है दादा जान दिल्ली से किसी की कॉल है हेलो यूसुफ अंकल कौन जी मैं सुमन बोल रही हूँ दिल्ली से आपके बचपन के दोस्त बलदेव जी की पोती याद है बचपन में आप दोनों झजरिया चुरा के खाते थे बचपन की तंग गली फिर से कूद फांदे छोटी छोटी मीठी चोरी काट ले के बांधे एक पतंग सा उड़ता था परिंदों की तरह परिंदों की तरह परिंदों की तरह एक दौर था मन मन मोर था एक दौर था मन मन मोर था पार्टिशन के वक्त हम रातों रात हिंदुस्तान आ गए यूसुफ जी बड़ी आजान दी है कागजों के कश्तियों में डूब रहता था झाकती खिड़कियों में उलझा रहता था वो अभी क्या दौर था मन पे न जोर था एक दौर था मन मन मोर था एक दौर था मन मन मोर था भैया थोड़ा जल्दी 
बर्थडे यार Hi, uh, did did that have English subtitles? I'm. I apologize for that because the original one you sent me just uh, doesn't include the subtitles. Oh dear, I'm terribly sorry. So I've inflicted. Oh, I, a... <laughs> I apologize. Sorry. No, uh, that was entirely my fault. Um, right. Apologies to everybody. I inflicted. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's actually very good if you could understand it. <laughs> but I think we all understand. Yes, right? but, well. We were able to follow the storyline. Right. Okay. Good. Good. <laughs> um, it, it's it's a good illustration of the, uh, uh, the positive theme of um, the internet as a um, oh, forge uh, of. Sorry for interrupting, but some um, was that Ejenurkaya says uh, sends a link which has subtitles. Would you like to rewatch, or we don't need it? I don't think we need it, um, but it, uh, if you'd Thank like you. to, it might be worth you in your own time. Um, but subtitles, it's a brilliant commercial. Um, yeah, right. um, the argument, the counter argument to this commercial is that Mark Zuckerberg um, promotes hate speech because it's profitable or because the state um, is authoritarian. And both those arguments are true. Um, but there are social processes in society that limit the benign effect of the internet. Let me go through some of them. Firstly, the community that is connected by the internet is the better off part of the community. 40% of the world don't have internet access. There are linguistic divisions. I mean, you are enormously impressive from that you're listening to a lecture in a foreign language, but most people can't speak other foreign languages. Um, only about 15% of the world can understand English. Um, so dialogue on the internet is reduced by the fact that people are mutually incomprehensible to each other. And if you try and use um, translation software, you're still completely mystified, even more mystified than the video you've just been watching. Um, language is a medium of power. Um, the Marathi population in India is bigger than the population in Britain, but few people outside that area speak Marathi. So if you write in Marathi on the online, most people are not going to understand you, whereas you write in English, um, they are. And most of the widely known languages in the world are languages of major empires. There are conflicts of values and interests in society, and they are played out in the media. National cultures have um, a magnetic pull still. Um, your country, my country being shining examples of that. So leading news websites report mainly national news. Only about a quarter of their content covers foreigners. Um, it used to be argued that the internet would be free because it was outside the jurisdiction of nation states. Just not true. Uh, governments have found ways of controlling the internet. And there are differences of social capital. The most online active people are also the most active offline 
and they tend to be recruited from the most educated and from higher social grades. So these are all different factors that qualify or limit or inhibit the global connection afforded by the internet. But there have been profound changes um, caused by the internet. And one of them is the empowerment of activists. The power of crowds has been mobilized by the internet. Um, the Me Too movement is a classic example of that. When Alyssa Milano tweeted, have you been molested? Right back saying Me Too. Two million people responded in one month and it became an international campaign that um, changed social norms in a variety of different countries. The power of pictures mobilized by the internet has also been a powerful force. The killing of George Floyd went worldwide and gave terrific impetus to the Black Lives Matter movement that is still running. Um, the internet has enabled social networking um, on an international scale. One of the reasons why the climate change lobby has become so effective in the last 10 years has been the way in which it's built a massive coalition, not merely of environmentalists, but also social justice campaigners and mobilized people on the streets. Um, the internet has mobilized consumer power. Let me give you one trivial example. Um, a part-time DJ called John Mortar was utterly fed up with the way in which the TV um, show, The X Factor competition winner, always got the number one slot in the Christmas sales. And um, he put out a tweet which went viral, supporting Rage Against the Machine, which had a line which went, as I recall, fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. Um, it got celebrity endorsements and it became the number one um, in the Christmas sales in 2009, a collective expression of um, opposition to corporate power. So let me wind up. Um, yes, the media landscape and consumption has been transformed, but there are still media charts as there always have been. There has been limited media democratization. The media's content um, shows continuity. The right, the dominance of neoliberalism, the rise of social liberalism, these are trends that are a response to wider processes in society, not media technology. Um, but yet, the internet has empowered activists in a way that will transform public life. Um, and it's also created a great TV renaissance. Um, so, in answer to the opening question, has the last 40 years seen um, a media revolution? My answer is half a revolution. Thanks for listening. Thank you for the brilliant talk, um, Mr. Curran. The technology, as you said, and the internet can be sometimes magnificent communication devices. Um, but it also could cause the big problems. I think it's based on whose hand it is, who has the power, uh, who has the discourse. It changes. But uh, while we're talking about journalism, I found myself uh, thinking of the Cambridge Analytica scandal with the Facebook, you know. And the other uh, subject I was thinking is uh, Mac journalism you know, the research uh, 
concept it derived from McDonaldization. So I was thinking about the efficiency because always the economic drives for especially the monopolies matters most, as you know, better. So uh, what would you like to say about these kind of things? And um, please, if you have questions, guests, uh, uh, please feel free to uh, share your comments and ask your questions in uh, by turning on your microphone. Uh, thank you again. And, and I think the point you're making is entirely right. Um, the economic power finds expression in different ways. In the case of Cambridge Analytica, it became clear that rich people um, bought data in order to influence the presidential campaign. And one of the strategies they adopted was to put out um, propaganda that was targeted at um, suppressing the democratic vote. Um, a very sophisticated strategy. Rather than trying to persuade Democrats to vote Republican, they set out to discourage them from voting at all. Um, and they used Cambridge Analytica data to refine their message and deliver it to the group receptive to that message. Um, so your point is entirely right. Thank you. Okay, guests. Um, do you have questions for Professor Kern? I yes. have one, but I don't want to take advantage of uh, uh, me uh, being an ex-student. So please, uh, other guests, uh, feel free. I'd like to uh, go. Okay. James, thank you so much for this wonderful and uh, enlightening and stimulating uh, speech. <laughs> you know, I've always been a great admirer of uh, your ability to put uh, these utterly complex matters into um, such an easily understandable, you know, frameworks, uh, concepts. Um, you summarize them so eloquently and explain them so well. Um, and it takes a great scholar uh, to be able to do that. And this is what you are. You're an exceptional scholar. And please uh, accept my sincere compliments to your speech. Um, I'd like to pose a little question, if I may, um, just uh, occurred to me while listening to you. Yesterday, we were having a small discussion with my PhD students, and one of them was making a presentation on, you know, McLuhan and his ideas about the, you know, media typologies like um, cool media, hot media, etc. So uh, we were having such a hard time to, you know, uh, contemplate on a new media Kenya. environment. Kenya. Kenya. Could you please? Yeah. <laughs> oh, someone is speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that isn't you, James. <laughs> okay, so we were having such a hard time, um, you know, in um, applying these uh, type of, um, uh, you know, pre-internet typologies uh, into modern day digital media. And in your speech, you've been, you know, talking about the continuities, uh, and I was wondering um, what kind of continuities uh, do you see um, in terms of the, you know, pre-internet typologies that we classify and think about media environment? Um, are we able to differentiate one from another, uh, or are they so much converged that uh, it's futile, you know? to even think about it. What do you say? I was just uh, wondering about Fine. that. Let, let, let me respond. Um, I should say in, in brackets that those friendly words from Deruba need to be reinterpreted. Um, what she was really saying was not that the speech I gave was any good, that I underlined 
every word in her PhD thesis that was a misuse of a word. <laughs> so she's really saying thank you <laughs> rather than be taken literally. Um, um, I don't, the, the, the cold, hot dichotomy on Marshall McLuhan, I never bought into, to be honest. There wasn't a shred or any of, other, you know, yeah, there wasn't any a other shred of evidence to, typologies. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you're a McLuhanite, you could obviously continue that dichotomy and try and extend it to new media. Um, so um, the argument that um, some media simultaneously engaged all your senses, um, you could apply to um, um, the internet. Um, I, I, I, I, I, so, but I never believed a word he said, to be honest. I couldn't understand why he was so famous. He had lots of jokes and he wrote in a still way, but said simple things. Um, but categories of analysis um, applied before the internet, clearly apply after the internet. So if you think of the great intellectual traditions in the social sciences, these remain valid um, and useful in the present time. Nothing has changed, it seems. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Curran. It's always um, good to go back to the classics. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Um, is there anything else would you like to ask? Do you have questions? It seems there is no more question. Okay, then I can, uh, I think we can finish. Um, thank you, that was brilliant, amazing. Um, and it changed really the way that I looked at some uh, terms of journalism. Thank you, Professor uh, Karen. And thank you for honoring us, sharing your knowledge, experiences, your learnings. And I hope to, we hope to see you uh, in the next uh, gym symposium, communication in the millennium symposium, hopefully. Um, stay healthy, take care of yourself, and thank you. Uh, sorry, there is a question. Is that okay? Sure. It's in the chat box. It's in the chat box, yes, now I can see. Uh, I apologize, I can't use my microphone right now, but I would love to hear Professor Kern's view on Metaverse. There is a current talk about Metaverse and Oren composing virtual space. How do you think these media giants will act or have in such a space? And do you think such a shift promise a new kind of democratization? Um, I think th it will change. I, I, I was at Stanford for a term as a visiting professor um, 15 years ago, and I was exposed to metaverse, meta, meta experiments, and they are completely mind blowing. I mean, it is an amazing experience, but often technology takes time. Um, uh, and um, in the case, for example, high definition television, um, it was around in Japan in the 1980s, but it took a long time to become universal. So um, the immersion in this new form of experience will, I think, um, take place and it will change things. Quite how, I don't know. Whether it's democratizing depends on who controls. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, Very good to see please you. Please come back, uh, but next time in person. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> Very good to see you. Thank you for inviting Lovely me. Lovely to see you. Thank you for honoring us. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye. 
Evet saat 15'te e, ikinci odamızda dijital marka reklamcılık, üçüncü odamızda siyaset, toplum ve kültür, e, dördüncü odamızda digital literacy, post-truth, digital identity oturumları olacaktır. E, oda 2 ve oda 3 Türkçe, oda 4 ise İngilizce olacaktır e, diyorum. And also in English, there's an announcement in room four, there will be digital literacy and post-truth digital identity will start at 3 p.m. Thank you.